Well, we've been doing this series called Open House, and today we want to talk about the fact that Jesus really is all we need. And, um, you know, it seems like the older I get, the more I learn that lesson that truly Christ is it. And um, most of the time, we have loss in our lives because of, you know, one of four things. Number one, we have loss in our lives because we just make stupid decisions. You know, we make dumb decisions. And as a result of it, sometimes we are our own worst enemy, and we do things that hurt ourselves. The second reason we have loss is because other people make really dumb decisions. And because of their dumb decisions, we end up hurting. And sometimes it doesn't seem fair, but the fact of the matter is we live in an evil world. And sometimes we pay the price for other people's decisions. The third reason that we have loss in our life is because we have an enemy And our enemy is real. As a matter of fact, he's as real as the nose on your face. He is Satan, and even though sometimes people like to make him a cartoon character or, you know, talk about the fact that he is something that, or somebody that doesn't exist, or blah, 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 whatever, the fact of the matter is he is real, and he really wants to ruin you. He wants to destroy your life. And a lot of times what Satan does is he uses sin to test you, or not test you, but to tempt you. And when he tempts you, he does that for the purpose of ruining you and destroying your life. And so uh, let me just say this about sin, if I could, for a minute. Um, sin is a very dangerous thing. And the reason is because what happens is, is, is sin many times will lure you in. And then before you know it, you're trapped. You know, before you know it, you are, it may be something that lures you in that everybody else is doing. It's not a big deal and, and whatever. But then all of a sudden, you find yourself trapped, and then sin in some way, shape, or form brings death, and then it traps you, and then it ruins and destroys. Satan wants to ruin your marriage, ruin your family, ruin your reputation, and he's not happy until you're destroyed. And so just just remember that. And I tell you, I've been doing this for 25 years in the ministry, and never one time has anybody ever come up to me and said, oh, Barry, you're not going to believe this, but, you know, I, I, I said a cuss word, and I'll never be able to move past that. It's holding me back. I'll never move past that cuss word that I said. Literally, nobody says that, you know. Nobody, nobody says, well, they, they did something towards somebody else that they, or whatever. Most of the time, when people have a sin in their life that they don't think they can overcome, typically it's sexual in nature. Just about every time. It always goes back to some kind of a, of a sexual sin in some way. I know we have kids in here, so I want to try to be cool and everything, but um, you know, the, the bottom line is, is, is that what, that's what happens. And I don't think it's a coincidence that God gives us this amazing story in the Old Testament about Joseph and how he's tempted by Potiphar's wife. And I'm sure, you know, she was a person of power and she was probably very beautiful and she was propositioning him in a very sexual way and all these different things. And you'll notice that Joseph did not stop and reason with her and say, you know, hmm, let me think this through, Mrs. Potiphar. probably shouldn't do this, just saying, right? But he didn't stop and talk about it. He didn't reason, you know, uh, about it. The Bible says he just ran. He ran as fast as he could. And there's, there's a reason why in the New Testament we get those two words that are very, very emphatic. It literally says, flee fornication. I remember back when I was in high school and I went to uh, church and I'm sitting there in my youth department, and I'm sitting there waiting for my youth pastor to come out and give a message. And he walks in, goes up on the stage, walks up to the podium, and literally at the top of his lungs, he yells as loud as he can. He goes, flee fornication! Like that. And we were all looking at each other like, he's done lost his mind. He's crazy. But you know what? I'm talking about it today. I mean, it had that much of an impression on me to where I'm thinking about it now, years and years later. I mean, it's just amazing how, so basically the Bible says to flee from it. And so understand that sin will destroy you. It is very, very dangerous. And so you have to understand that um, we have an enemy that wants to ruin us through temptation. Now, the fourth reason we have loss in our lives is because we have a God that wants to strengthen us. And a whole lot of times, God will uh, test us 
in order to strengthen us. And sometimes the test that God will bring in your life is loss. And sometimes it's a profound loss. And you're going to have every opportunity to get ticked off at God and yell at God and scream at God and get angry at God. And God is just saying, hey, listen, relax, trust me. Because sometimes we have to get to the place in our lives where God is all we have to learn that incredible, profound lesson that really God is all we need. And literally, that's what this message is all about. It's the fact that Jesus is all that we need. He is all that we need. And, and you know, we just need to learn that lesson. I've got a friend of mine by the name of Dave Bartula, who I've told you about so many different times. And he calls me from time to time. And I promise you this. If we have a 20-minute conversation, he will talk for 18 minutes. I will talk for two. Literally. He dominates the conversation. And he always, all he wants to talk about is God. God is so good. God is so faithful. You know, God is, God meets every single one of my needs. God is so amazing. I mean, literally, that's all that he talks about. He goes, yeah, I remember that verse. Oh my gosh, just supply all your needs. And literally just goes on and on. And here I am, the pastor. I'm trying to change the topic. Isn't that terrible? I'm trying to say, well, yeah, well, what about the Patriots? He, he doesn't want to talk about the Patriots. He's from New England. He loves the Patriots. He doesn't want to talk about the Patriots. He, I say, yeah, well, how's your wife doing? He'll talk about her maybe for a little bit, but then he's right back over to God. Yeah, she's great, but isn't God amazing? <laughs> and I like blows me away every time he calls. So let me tell you this. Three weeks ago, his daughter was brutally murdered. And I've told you about him so many different times, so you know about Dave Bartula. His daughter's name was Jen. She was 30 years old. She had two precious little kids. And somebody took her life. So I was able to talk with him on the phone, you know, after I found out about it and all these different things. And this past Tuesday, I'm in a meeting with the trustees talking about the budget for 2016. My phone rings, and I see his name pop up, Dave Vartula. And I'm like, oh, man. He is probably absolutely just devastated, and he probably just wants to talk about the fact that he's lost his daughter and all these different things. I didn't get the call right then and there because I was with the trustees, but afterwards, on the way home, I called, and he answered right away. Do you know what he talked about? Yeah. Same thing. God, how good he is how awesome he is, how faithful he is, how he meets needs. And to be honest with you, I'm on the other side of the phone getting educated. I'm getting educated. Because it is almost as if, even though this guy has gone through some of the most profound loss you could ever go through, it's almost now as if his love for Jesus is even deeper. It's even stronger because of the loss that he's gone through. Sometimes God allows us to go through loss, and sometimes it's profound loss so that he can show up and he can prove that he's faithful and prove that he's strong, prove that he's going to come alongside you. Because I'm going to tell you this, Dave's attitude to me was this, Jesus is all that I need. Jesus will take care of me. Jesus wasn't surprised by this. Jesus will give me the strength. Jesus will get me through. And it's almost like Dave on the other side of the phone is saying this. I choose Jesus. I choose to trust in him. I choose to follow him. Man, I could get so angry right now, but I'm not going to do it. Many of you guys know we have a, a guy that goes to our church, and his name is Michael Higgins. And Michael is an amazing man. He has a testimony that says in one day, at one moment in time, he lost all the women in his life. His wife, his daughter, and his mother all went shopping together. They were in a head-on collision with a dump truck, and all three of them were killed. And he's the one that calls me. He's the one that texts me. He's the one that comes to my office to meet with me for the sole purpose of trying to encourage me, trying to lift me up. Do you know how many times I've heard his story? Do you know how many times I've heard Michael Higgins say, God has gotten me through. God has given me strength. God has been so faithful. It's absolutely amazing when I hear this guy's testimony. And the cool thing about it was several years ago, now God took all the women in his life, but he still had his son, his little son named Micah. This was 28 years ago, by the way. 
his little son Micah. And every time Michael had gotten to the place where he was so discouraged that he literally contemplated taking his life, he got so discouraged he wanted to commit suicide that he looked at his son Micah and he said, I can't. Because God gave me a son. And I got to take care of my son. You know how many times he said to me, Micah saved my life? God gave me Micah, and in giving me Micah, it saved my life. And it brought him through some of the deepest and darkest days of his life. And literally, Michael is the one that says, now, Jesus came alongside me. Jesus met my needs. Jesus gave me strength. Jesus is all that I need. And so let me tell you this. What I'm telling you this morning is this. I'm not just getting up here giving you pastor stuff where I come up and stand up and say, follow Jesus, everyone. I'm not talking about a concept. I'm not talking about anything that's conceptual. I am talking about reality, that Jesus is real, that his provision is real, that he truly meets needs, that he truly comes alongside of us, and that he can give us hope and fulfillment like nobody or like nothing else ever possibly could in our lives. That's how amazing he is. People come to me all the time and they say, I just lost my husband, I just lost my wife, I just lost my reputation, I just lost this or whatever. They decided to just turn their back on me and leave. And I, I don't know how many times I've looked at people and I've said this, your life is not over. It's not over. God's not done with you. God is only teaching you something that you're gonna learn at a very deep level right now in your life, probably other people won't learn a lesson as deeply as you will right now, but he is gonna turn this around and he is gonna use this lesson in your life to cause you to be effective for him in some way, shape, or form. He's just gonna do it. Your life's not over. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. Sometimes we think about our husband or our wife like, man, I married him and he's gonna meet all my needs. Well, guess what? He sure is not. He didn't. And it's the same thing with the, the woman that you married. She's amazing. She's hot. She's beautiful. She's going to meet all my needs. She will never meet all your needs because she's a human being. We have these unrealistic expectations when we get into these marriages and we think they're going to meet all my needs. No, it's impossible. Jesus is the only one that can meet all your needs. That's why I look at people in their face when somebody, a loved one, walks away from them or betrays them. I say, really, all you kind of need is Jesus anyway. It's cool. I wanted to give you a couple of reasons, a few reasons this morning why Jesus is the only person you'll need. Number one, because of the promises that Jesus makes. Now let me tell you this, the promises that Jesus makes, no human can fulfill. He's the only one that can do them. These promises are way above our pay grade. He's the only one that can do it. Only, these are God-sized promises and it takes God to meet these, these uh, keep these promises in our life. For example, in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, when he says, not only will I give you rest, but I'll give you rest for your soul. <laughs> no human being can do that. In Psalm 147, in verse number three, when it says that God can heal a broken heart, I've never known a person that can do that. You can go to a doctor and heal a broken arm, but you can't heal a broken heart. God is the one that can heal a broken heart. He is the one that makes that promise that he can do that. And think about it. When you have profound loss in your life and you have a burden in your life, you have a need in your life, you feel a weakness in your life, Jesus makes these promises. He says this, when it comes to your burdens, I will bear them. 1 Peter 5, 7, that's what he says. When it comes to your needs, I will meet them. Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 19. He said he would meet all of our needs. When it comes to your weaknesses, I will use your weaknesses to showcase my strength because I am strong and you are weak. And if you're sitting here today thinking, trust me, I don't have it. I'm too weak. God can never use me. Oh no, God's looking for you. The person that sits here and thinks you cannot be used of God and you're too weak and you have no ability, trust me, you're a first round draft pick. He, he's coming after you. You're the exact person that he's coming after. 
When it comes to the events of your life, Jesus says, I will use them for good, Romans 8, 28. When it comes to your eternity, after your little vapor of a life, I will give you an eternal home in heaven, John chapter 10 and verse number 28. Every single one of these promises are connected to Jesus. And what I'm saying to you is that Jesus is all you need. He will take care of you. He really will. And he will do it in a way no husband can, no wife can, no new car can, no job promotion can. He will take care of you in a way that no one or nothing else can. And that's why I say Jesus is all you need. So a few verses really fast. 1 Peter 5, 7. Give all your worries and cares to God because he cares about you. That's God's way of saying, would you please stop trying to control your losses? Would you please have enough faith and trust in me that, and accept whatever outcome I bring to your life? I'm God. I got this. Literally, that's what he's saying. Philippians chapter 4, in verse number 19, Paul says, trust me, been there, done that, got the t-shirt. I know what it's like to have needs, and yet God met my needs. And then Paul says to all the people at Philippi, he says, the same God that met my needs is the same God that's going to meet all of your needs. Not just your financial needs, but your relational needs, your physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, financial, all of your needs, God will meet your needs. That's what he says. He'll do it. Philippians 4.19. Based on what? His glorious riches. Found in whom? Jesus Christ. Found in Christ. It all goes back to Jesus. It's all rooted in Jesus. My favorite one is 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 9. When basically Jesus looks at Paul and says, my grace is sufficient for you. You see, the reason why that's so amazing is because the word grace means benefit, favor, joy, and pleasure. Benefit, favor, joy, and pleasure. That's what it means. And so really what God is saying is this. Listen, cool your jets. I'm going to give you enough benefit. I'm going to give you enough joy. I'm going to give you enough favor. I'm going to give you enough pleasure. But for whatever reason, we're never satisfied. I gotta have more. I'm addicted to pleasure. I'm addicted to joy. I got to have lots of joy. I got to have lots of benefit, lots of favor. Matter of fact, I don't like it when anybody else gets favor. I want, my, I want the favor. And God says, relax. I will give you enough. Trust me. You know what's amazing? If we would fall back on the promises of God that he will give us enough benefit and favor, we're going to be a whole lot less jealous and envious of the people around us who get the, same, who get the benefit and the favor. We sit back and we say, well, you know what? Everybody else gets all the favor. I hate Christmas. We get around in a big family and it's all about them. Everybody just asks, what is, you know, it's all about that family, that person, my brother, my sister, my stinking uncle, tired of my uncle. You know, I'm making this up right now, but <laughs> the bottom line is, we all get bent out of shape because it looks like somebody else gets a little bit more favor when instead of our having our heart poisoned, let's take a step back and hold on to the promises of God that the God of the universe looks at you t at your face and he basically says, I will give you enough favor, Barry. Stop it. We, we, at work, we sit back and we say, you're going to really promote him. He's getting the promotion. You're telling me it's going to him. You've got to be kidding me. He's a slug. <laughs> this company is on my back. And he does nothing and you're giving him a promotion. Instead of that, take a step back. Hold on to the promises of God. Don't let it poison your heart. Keep working. Keep serving your real boss who is in heaven. Keep doing everything that you possibly can to the best of your ability. And say, congratulations, slug. <laughs> no, don't say that. But say congratulations. You know why? Because I believe in a promise that says the God of the universe is going to give me enough favor. And by the way, let me say this. It's not totally up to your boss whether or not you get promoted or whether or not you get an increase in your salary or whatever it may be. It's up to your God. God's in control of those things. You don't have to walk in fear and walk on eggshells because you're afraid your boss is this or that or the other and my whole you know, well-being is completely attached to this guy. That's baloney. 
It's attached to the Lord, to the God of the universe. You keep serving him. He will give you enough favor. He will give you enough benefit in your life. He just will. Sometimes we sit back and we think, you know what? We've got the only jacked up family in the neighborhood. (laughs) Christmas at our house is a nightmare. We're throwing bulbs at each other. Food cake, you know, fruit cake, food fight, you know, as far as I'm, you know, or whatever. And then we all walk out the front door like this. Like we're perfect. Hello, children. Yes, these are our children. They're all perfect. That's baloney. You know what we need to do? Take a step back and hold on to the promise that God will give us enough joy and enough pleasure. He will do it. And thank God for your jacked up family. I thank God for all, we're all jacked up. That's what I say. Every single one of us are. We're all struggling. All of us have needs. We think we're the only ones, but it's not true. So God will give you enough. The second thing is this. Why is Jesus all I need? Because of the first commandment. I think about the fact that God gives us these 10 commandments, and really, every single command, every, a lot of times we look at commandments and we think, oh yeah, God's just being mean. Yeah, another commandment. He wants me to do this and do that. Put me all up in a box. I can't do anything, can't go anywhere, can't have any fun. Thanks a lot, God. Oh, another commandment? You know, a lot of times, I just think we look at it wrong. It's not about the fact that God... It's not about the fact that God is trying to limit us. It's the fact that he is trying to set us free. He's trying to benefit us. He's trying to bless us. He says, guys, this is a pathway to blessing. And every single one of these commandments represents a release, a blessing, a benefit. Please understand what I'm trying to do with these commandments. And I love the way he starts them. Before he goes even into the first commandment, he goes, let's just set the table. I'm the one that freed you. I'm the one that got you out of Egypt. So now let's go to number one. Don't have any other gods except me. Number one. Don't elevate anything or anybody above me. I have to be number one. I'm the one that set you free. I love how he gives that to us. So here's the thing. A teenager that worships attention and will do anything to get attention. Let me tell you what that is. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. It's dangerous when you take the love for attention and put it above your God, as if God can't give you enough of what you need. The woman who worships romance to the point of trying to get romance outside of her marriage, let me tell you what it is, it's dangerous. The man who worships pornography and sex and then tries to get those desires fulfilled outside of his marriage, let me tell you what it is, It's dangerous. It's dangerous to take anything and elevate it above God and to not trust him. And it's almost as if God is saying, guys, listen, here's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to save you a lot of heartache. I'm trying to save you from disappointment after disappointment after disappointment because we have a tendency to go to all the wrong places to find hope and fulfillment. And it never satisfies. God's just trying to save us a whole lot of trouble and saying, look, put me first and you won't be disappointed. I love that verse in Romans chapter 10 and verse number 11. It says, whoever believes in Jesus will never be disappointed. Whoever puts Jesus first in their life and says these words, hey, you know what? He's all I need. That's how I direct my life. That's how I make the decisions in my life. It's Jesus. Because every time we elevate something above God, We always get disappointed. The last reason, right before we as a church family have communion together this afternoon, the last point is this. Why is Jesus all I need? Because of the life of Mary and Joseph and their example. They show us absolute, as clear as a bell. They teach us in the way that they acted and the decisions that they made that it was Jesus and Jesus first in their lives. So Mary's pregnant. She's pregnant by the Holy Spirit, which doesn't happen at all, ever. So because of this incredible miracle that's happened in her body, she now, you know, has, she can, she's going to make a comment. She's going to say something. And she could have easily said, okay, 
uh, no one's going to believe me. So everybody's going to think that I've been promiscuous. Everybody's going to think that I cheated. Everybody's going to think that I did wrong because there's no, I'm going to say, no, really, you're not going to believe this, but it was the Holy Spirit. It was nobody else. It was crazy. It's this amazing thing. They're going to go, yeah, right. She could have said this, I'm going to lose my fiance and I love him. He's amazing. He's the kindest, most godly man that I've ever met in my life. And he's going to freak when I tell him this. There's literally no way he's going to believe me. Literally everything was on the line for Mary when she found out this information from the angel. And here's what the Bible says that Mary said. She didn't say any of those things. This is what she said. Luke chapter 1 and verse 38. The interesting thing about it was this. What she said flowed out of who she was. What she basically says is, first let me tell you who I am. First let me tell you, so many people come up to me all the time. They say, what should I do? What should I do? What should I do for God? What should I do for God? And a lot of times I think God wants us to stop asking what, he wants, what we should do for him and ask, what, do you, what does he want me to be for him? Who should I be first? Because doing always flows out of being, always. Who you are always determines what you do. What your heart, the condition of your heart always determines your words and your actions. It's always that way. And so Mary starts off with this amazing thing. In Luke chapter 1 and verse 38, she starts off by saying this, I am. I am the Lord's servant. That's who I am. And because I am the Lord's servant, it just makes sense that I would be willing to do uh, nothing other than except whatever my master wants for my life. And that's exactly what she says. Because of the fact that I'm his servant, it makes all the sense in the world that I would be willing to accept whatever my master wants in my life. And then she says, may everything that you have said come true. So basically what she was saying is this. I choose Jesus over a good reputation. I choose Jesus over, jo over Joseph. And I really love Joseph. But I choose Jesus over over Joseph. And that's exactly what she did. We all know how Joseph felt because in Matthew 1 19, in, uh, the, the Bible literally says that he chose to break off the engagement. It's over. It's done. He said, I'm done. I'm hurt. I've been betrayed. This is done. But because of his character, he chose not to humiliate her publicly. He chose to keep everything quiet and to put her away privately, he, it says, so that she wouldn't be disgraced publicly. And by the way, I think that's a really good thing to do in a, in a relationship. Always have it in the back of your mind. I am never going to humiliate my wife publicly. I'm never going to humiliate my husband publicly. I'm never going to humiliate my kids publicly. I think that's a really good thing to live by. Character move. Verse 20. As he considers it, he falls asleep. And the angel of the Lord appears to him in a dream and says, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to go ahead with your marriage to Mary. For the child within her has been conceived by the Holy Spirit. That's the angel's way of looking at Joseph and saying this. She's telling the truth. Believe her. You want to have a shot of adrenaline and, and strength in your relationship? Then believe your wife. Believe your husband. Believe your kids. And you're like, my kids, I can't believe. My. No, whatever. <laughs> have trust in them. So Caesar makes this decree that everybody in the Roman Empire needs to participate in the census. So everybody has to return back to their home of origin. And since Joseph was of the house and lineage of David, he had to go back to Bethlehem. So isn't it interesting that God uses Caesar to make a uh, decree that affects everyone in the Roman Empire for the sole purpose of getting one couple back to Bethlehem? Because literally the prophet Micah had said hundreds of years before that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. There was only one place that he could be born, and that was Bethlehem. We got to get the couple to Bethlehem. And that's what happened. My question to you is this. When you go back to Bethlehem, which is your house of origin, which where you have a lot of family, let me ask you, when you guys go home, back to home, wherever home is, do you typically stay in a hotel? No. I mean, your parents or your mother or your brother or whatever would probably be a little offended. Yeah, thanks for inviting us, but we'll be in a hotel. 
that would be a little offensive. Who in the world goes back to their home and stays in a hotel? I'm guessing probably somebody who would rather not put up with judgmental stares. Probably someone who would rather not deal with nosy questions about what's going on. Remember, when they made the trip from Nazareth to Bethlehem, she was great with child. So she's going around like this. <laughs> she got a baby. She's about ready to pop. And Joseph's not going to be able to hide that. He's not going to be able to go like this the whole time. Goodbye, me, Mary. Hi. Merry Christmas. Oh, I guess that was the first Christmas. What is this Christmas you speak of? <laughs> the problem is all the hotels were booked. They couldn't get in anywhere. And the reason was because everybody was coming back to their home of origin for this ridiculous census, right? That had just the wrong time. Only was it the wrong time? Perfect timing. God was using, he was he was executing his will perfectly, his timing perfectly. And it just makes all the sense in the world that the only place left was a stable. It makes all the sense in the world that the Lamb of God would be born in a stable. That the bread of life would literally be laid in a food trough. And that he would be born in a town that literally means house of bread. Because that's exactly what happened. And through all of it, what do we see? we see a couple who went through some tremendous loss when it comes to their reputation say this, I choose Jesus. I would rather be connected to the Messiah than have the greatest reputation in town. I would rather be connected to the Messiah than even have my husband or my future husband, Joseph. That's what Mary was saying. Pretty amazing. I mean, even later on in his um, ministry, he's talking to the Pharisees, and in John chapter 8 and verse number 41, they basically dropped this bomb on him. They said, well, at least we weren't born in legitimately. <laughs> what were they referring to? Well, the talk that was probably still going around about Mary and about his birth. All I'm saying is, is this. We see in their lives, in the promises of God, and in all of these different things we've looked at today, the fact that Jesus really is all we need. What I want to do now is ask the ushers, if they would come and help us with the uh, communion. We're going to pass out a piece of bread to you, and we're going to pass out a little cup of grape juice. And I'm going to ask you if you would be so kind as to hold the bread and hold the grape juice while we're passing that out so we can all partake of communion together as a church family. So here's, here's what I want to say while they're passing out the bread and the grape juice. I wanted to say that anytime you choose Jesus over someone or something else, it's a really, really, really good decision. It's a great decision because you can't possibly be discouraged or let down or unfulfilled if you choose Jesus. Every other choice leaves you empty. Every other choice leaves you unfulfilled. Every other choice does. So here's the thing. We have a family in our church. They're named the Harveys. You probably know Bill and Debbie real well. They have this uh, organization called Helping Haitian Angels. And when they first started this organization, there was a board that they had. And the board said, we want to meet with you, Bill and Debbie. And they said, okay, great. What's it about? Well, it's about taking a vote as to whether or not we're going to keep Jesus in this organization. Because we don't think it ought to be about Jesus. If we make this about Jesus, we're going to lose a lot of money. We're going to lose a lot of big donors. And so it would be so much better if we just kind of set Jesus aside when it comes to this organization. Debbie stood up and said, no, we're not doing that. We're not taking Jesus out of this. And isn't it amazing that over time, most all of those board members have all left and are gone. And Jesus has taken a hold of this ministry called Helping Haitian Angels and has blessed it beyond belief. He has hand over fist given them donations and they've got land and they're building buildings and they're helping you know, tons and tons of people and kids and educating them and feeding them and clothing them and giving them Jesus. And I'll tell you something, but it started with a woman who had the guts to stand up and say, no, we will not take Jesus out of this organization. Jesus is all we need. Jesus is the most important. Jesus is the one that has all the power. Jesus 
gives us eternal salvation. Jesus literally is the way, the truth, and the life. Thank you so much, Dave. I appreciate it, bud. Jesus is the one that bears our burdens. Jesus is the one that meets our needs. Jesus is the one that gives us strength. Jesus is better than any person we could ever choose. He's better than our reputation. He's better than pornography. He's better than a job promotion. He's better than a bigger house. He's better than a new car. Choose Jesus. That's what we're about today. Choose Jesus. And if you've already chosen Jesus, then choose to obey him and give him your life and follow him with everything. So what Jesus basically did was this. He brought his disciples together and he said, listen, I'm getting ready to do something that's going to split all of time into two, basically. He didn't say that, but that's what he was doing. I'm getting ready to make the greatest sacrifice in the history of earth, and I don't want you to forget it. I am shedding my blood, and I am going to have my body broken. It would have been easy for Jesus to be king. It's simple. Simple for him to be king. It's simple for him to conquer one empire and save one generation of people. Instead, he decided to conquer the greatest enemy of all, which is sin, death, and the grave, and to benefit every man, woman, and child that ever has lived or ever will live. That's what Jesus did. And every drop of blood that was ever shed in the Old Testament was nothing but a foreshadow or a picture of the greatest sacrifice that will ever be given, and that's Jesus. Those sacrifices were incomplete, and they had to be done over and over and over again. Jesus' sacrifice was complete. He died once for sin for all. That's how amazing it is. And he said, I don't want you to forget it. So what I want you to do is, every once in a while, I want you to take a piece of bread, and I want you to take um, the fruit of the vine, and I want you to... Remember the blood that I shed for you and remember my body that was broken for you and I want you to remember how much I love you. So that's what we're doing. And it gives us an opportunity to do two very important things. The first thing is this. If you're here today without Christ, I would ask you a simple question. Why would you receive the symbolic Jesus before you receive the real Jesus? You see, this is a piece of bread And this is some grape juice. They just bought it at Giant. It's not going to save you. It's symbolic. Revelation 1.5 says the only thing that can wash away sin is the blood of Jesus Christ. And so this is a picture of his blood. It's an object lesson. It's a symbol of his body. So I want to ask you if you'd bow your heads and close your eyes for just a minute. And if you're here today and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, well, today's the day. Today's the day to receive the greatest gift of all, and that's Christ. I want to ask you with simple faith to pray a simple prayer and invite Jesus into your heart right now. Why don't you pray something like this? Dear Heavenly Father, I want you to know that I believe. I believe. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I believe that three days later he rose from the dead. And that he did it to pay for my sins. I admit it. I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. Please wash me clean. Please give me a second chance. Please change my life. I receive the real Jesus into my heart right now by faith. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.